Good evening. I'm Samantha Power, and I'm the director of the Human Rights Initiative here at the Kennedy School. It is my great pleasure to welcome you here to the ARCO Forum for this commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and indeed a celebration also of the vision uh, of Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the driving force behind the articulation of these principles and the drafting of this declaration. Before we start, I'd just like to thank a number of people besides Eleanor Roosevelt for making this evening possible. Uh, first, Greg Carr, our advisory board chairman. I'd like to thank him for his generous and unfailing commitment to human rights and to the school. Graham Allison, also the chairman of the initiative, who has done a great deal to help guide our early development. And tonight's co-sponsors, perhaps most importantly, Harvard Law School's Human Rights Program, the Women in Public Policy Program here at the Kennedy School, and last but not least, Physicians for Human Rights, which, has done, which is a first-class organization and has done a terrific amount to make this event happen. Um, though we're not expecting any emergencies here tonight, I should note that there are enough doctors in the audience, thanks to the co-sponsorship of Physicians for Human Rights, to uh, cater to each and every one of you. We here at the Human Rights Initiative are especially pleased to honor the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration, as our program was in fact launched in conjunction with this anniversary. And it was this document, and in fact the woman behind it, who inspired our benefactor, Greg Carr, to set up a human rights program at the Kennedy School. Eleanor's appointment to represent the United States at the UN caused great controversy, as you might imagine, among the many male delegates in New York. As Eleanor put it herself, they looked here and there for somewhere to put me where I couldn't cause any trouble. Sure enough, what did they settle upon back in 1948 but the Human Rights Committee? Who could imagine that a human rights community, that anybody could do any damage working on a, an obscure subject such as human rights? It seemed an ideal committee, an ideal desert, really, in which to park the spirited widow of uh, President Roosevelt. But Eleanor didn't lie down and take it. Instead, with great will and skill, she methodically went about formulating a universal declaration and overcoming innumerable objections to the individual norms and to the entire concept of universal rights. Senior statesmen of the day didn't think that human rights mattered, and they certainly didn't think that Eleanor could do anything to make them matter. Yet here we are 50 years later, and we need only look around the room, look around at the crowd, look at our panelists and the work that they've done, look at the work that so many of you are doing to know how wrong, how very wrong they were. We are honored to have Susan Weld with us tonight. Susan, sitting to my left, is a fellow in East Asian Legal Studies here at the Law School at Harvard. She has lectured in law and East Asian cultures and languages here and elsewhere and served as a member of the official U.S. delegation to the U.N. Fourth World Conference on Women. But besides all that, Susan is also a cousin of Eleanor Roosevelt, several generations removed. And though many of us remember Eleanor for her marriage to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the First Lady was also the niece of Theodore Roosevelt, who was Susan's great-grandfather. So without further ado, please help me welcome our moderator, Susan Roosevelt Weld. Thanks a lot. As I was saying to Samantha earlier, I've always claimed Eleanor Roosevelt for my side of the family. We can now forget about those minor political differences between the Theodore Roosevelts and the GOP and FDR. Well, I'd like to begin really tonight with what Adlai Stevenson had to say about her after she died, because I think it's, it's a great symbol for this effort tonight. He said, she would rather light a candle then curse the darkness, and her glow has warmed the world. And I do think her glow has warmed the world, and what our job is tonight is to keep that glow alive, to make that candle keep burning into the next century. So uh, uh, that's just sending out the general hope for this evening. I want to begin with one of my favorite of her sentiments. And I know that she would not have objected to my taking liberties with her use of the masculine pronoun. In her day, man, him, and he stood for all people. But now we've, we've changed our attitude on that, and I'd like to uh, alter her use of the language to express that. This is how it goes. Where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on the map of the world. Yet they are the world for every individual person the neighborhood she or he lives in, 
the school or college she or he attends, the factory, farm, or office where he or she works. Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. And without concerted citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. Thus we believe that the destiny of human rights is in the hands of all our citizens in all our communities. So that's, that's the call for us to go on with tonight. We gather here in hopes of contributing to that concerted citizen action and of furthering Eleanor's vision and perhaps even reinvigorating it for the next century. At the time that the, human, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights first came up at the UN, the world was appalled by the world wars that had taken so many lives and called, caused so much suffering. Eleanor thought that lack of standards for human rights in the world was one of the greatest causes of friction among nations, and that the recognition of human rights might become one of the cornerstones on which peace could eventually be based. She believed this aim could only be met by recognizing that human rights are universal and thus transcend state sovereignty. In her words, all members and collectively to see that the lights of freedom are not further extinguished throughout the world. Every member has a responsibility to see that the rights of women and men are safeguarded, for no country is perfect in protecting the individual rights of citizens. As Samantha said, Eleanor was appointed to the first US delegation by President Truman in 45 and became chair of the Human Rights Committee soon after. It seems that the men on the delegation thought that she would be safely out of the way in what they felt was sure to be a backwater. I want to stop for a moment and ask, does anyone here, other than historians of the period, remember the names or preoccupations of those other members of the delegation? <laughs> Mrs. FDR, Eleanor Roosevelt was the one we remember from that General Assembly. And we're going to try to keep her name alive. I'd like to see that as a symbol of the success that, that can be ours. There will always be the naysayers, the self-described pragmatists, the serious people, all too often the serious men, who want to tell you that there is no hope for further change, to forget about those high ideals. What we should remember tonight is that in this case, up until now, anyway, those ideals won out. The ideals are what we remember from 1948. Mrs. FDR was determined to seize that 90, 1945 moment of war-weary consensus to press ahead with the job of drafting the Universal Declaration. It was, of course, not only what we think of now, the Soviet bloc, that was opposed to the adoption of the Declaration. In a contemporary statement on human rights made by the American Anthropological Association, the great structuralist Levi Strauss asked, how can the proposed declaration be applicable to all human beings and not a statement of rights conceived only in terms of the values prevalent in Western Europe and America? As all of you know, the universalism won out over relativism at that winter night, on that winter night in 1948, but this issue is far from dead today and it's something we all have to think about and how to have to grapple with. Eleanor herself, in addressing the General Assembly, spoke of the compromises inherent in a document that reflects the composite views of many individuals and governments. And Lou Henkin expresses this idea in his description of the Universal Declaration as a kind of uh, de minimis common denominator for human rights ideas. Mrs. FDR herself stressed the, that the document as finally agreed upon by all UN members at that time, would serve as a common standard of achievement for all peoples in all nations. And she expressed the hope that it would become an international Magna Carta for the world. And it's worth noting today, amid calls for cultural relativism, that the Universal Declaration was adopted without dissent. That is, all members of the United Nations were in agreement and members of many, many other nations took part in the drafting and, and drew upon their cultural ideas and cultural conceptions and convictions about human rights in drafting that universal uh, declaration. 
No member state then was willing to argue that human rights should not be subject to the efforts of an organization that represented the interests and ideals of the entire world. Now, in a world in which the overwhelming majority of states, including the U.S., have at least in name adhered to the Universal Declaration, we ask this very important question, whether 50 years after Eleanor Roosevelt first spearheaded the push for a Declaration of Rights for all persons, the United States of America has kept the promises embodied in that Universal Declaration. It's really, it's very, um, it's unfair for us somehow to go out to the world and spend, focus all our energies on getting other nations to adhere to these ideals without doing our very utmost to make sure that we, we are doing it here at home. And uh, tonight we're turning the spotlight on ourselves so that we may be true to Eleanor's warning and less human rights have meaning here at home, they have little meaning anywhere. So I'm gonna to turn to the first panel, which is a panel on health and the right to health and the state of healthcare in this country in the United States of America. The Universal Declaration has this to say about health in Article 25. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including medical care. Uh, Dr. Geiger will surprise, supply us with detailed statistics, but to give you a rough idea, in the U.S. in 1997, 43.4 million people, I don't know if these are the same statistics you've been dealing with, approximately 16% of the population had no health insurance of any kind, 15% of all American children, and nearly 33% of all poor people are uninsured. In light of these numbers, the topic of the first panel is even more urgent. Is there a right? Is there a real right to health care in the United States? And who has it if there is a right? And how can we make sure that those without health insurance are enabled to exercise their right to health care if they have one? So uh, in, in terms of equality of this right, I think we may have gone backward. Uh, and certainly in some countries, such as China, people have gone backward from a relatively low and equal level of access to health care to one which allows high-tech care to those who have the money to pay for it. To discuss uh, the aspects of the right to health and health care, it's with great pleasure that I introduce the first two panelists tonight who are sitting right here. Uh, Jack Geiger, Dr. Geiger is currently New York Medical School is a founding member and past president of Physicians for Human Rights, one of our co-sponsors tonight. He has led Physicians for Human Rights investigations to Yugoslavia, Iraq, and the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Uh, and Dr. Geiger was in on the ground floor of the human rights movement. And next to Dr. Geiger is uh, Billy Avery, founder of the National Black Women's Health Project. And she's been a women's health care advocate for 20 years. She's combined activism and social responsibility in developing a national forum for health care problems of African-American women. And she's appeared in a PBS documentary, I don't know if any of you have seen, called It's Up to Us, uh, for the UN Decade Conference on Women, and has published many articles in the field of health care. I love that slogan, it's up to us. It really is up to us. So I'm going to hand the floor over to you, Jack and Billy, and uh, Thank you. start out on health. I'm going to stand up. I don't know what Billy is going to do. I haven't had this many lights in my eyes since the last time I was interrogated by the police. And while that may be a reminiscent setting for discussion of human rights, it's hard to read up there. Uh, we only have about eight minutes each, and we're going to try and hold to that so that there's time for dialogue and discussion. Uh, but I want to begin by saying how pleased I am to be here at this kind of discussion, at this kind of anniversary in reflection not only of my own conviction that health and human rights are inextricably interwoven, but that of not only Physicians for Human Rights, but uh, the other organizations that are represented here. We were given a set of questions to address, and the first was who enjoys the right to health or health care in the United States? Uh, and I want to begin by pointing out the obvious, that uh, a simplistic framing of a right to health uh, doesn't get you very far. If a child is born anencephalic or with Tay-Sachs disease and is going to die in six months, who has deprived that child of his or her 
right to help. It's not a question that leads to anything operationally useful. It is only when, as we've already heard, and I'll get to Article 25, when we expand the scope of that question that we begin to see some of the connections that should concern us uh, tonight. Uh, when we recognize that the real determinants of any population's health are not primarily medical care, they are the social environment, the biological environment, the physical environment. Leon Eisenberg just a few days ago uh, put it all very succinctly that all disease is social, uh, at least in part, that the determinants of uh, the distribution of health and disease in a population uh, reflect, and that's true in our own country, reflect where those people live, what they eat, uh, the air and water they consume, their work, their housing, their interconnections with others, and the status they occupy within the social structure. It doesn't mean that medical care doesn't have an effect and isn't important, but it is not primary. And it is this recognition of the importance of those three environments that leads us directly to Article 25, the rights to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of all people and their families, including food, clothing, housing, medical care, and necessary social services. And so from the outset, we are talking about social and economic rights being basic to any conception of a right to health, or at least the opportunity uh, to achieve uh, a healthy state. And there are other rights in the Universal Declaration, as we shall see, that bear on this as well. The right to environmental protection as compared to racial and other forms of environmental injustice. The right to education, so strongly correlated with health status. The right to be free of discrimination by race, ethnicity, or gender. The right, we are talking about civil and political rights as being intrinsic to any conception of at least the opportunity for a right to health. And these things are true in Kosovo, in former Yugoslavia, in Gaza and the West Bank, in South Africa, in all of the other places where I and many other places, physicians, human rights, and other colleagues have worked uh, over this last decade. Do we meet these standards and obligations uh, in the United States? Uh, I'm not going to drown you in statistics. There isn't time. Poverty in the United States is the most powerful predictor of health status, of infant mortality rates, of mortality rates, of life expectancy, and this is socioeconomic status, and its confounder race. Uh, maybe we can get to some of the specifics uh, during question time. It's bad. It's getting worse. It has been getting worse in many ways over the last 20 years. Secondly, race and racial discrimination, not just socioeconomic status operating here, not just the barriers of access to, pair, to care, not just the confounding uh, with the environment, with housing, with food, with all of the social and economic rights, but not just access to care, but within uh, the performance of medical care itself. If we imagine two men, one white, one African American, both with coronary artery disease, uh, each with the same health insurance, each with the same income, each with the same level of education, each at the same kind of caring institution, uh, each with the same presence or absence of other disease, uh, each in need of uh, coronary angioplasty or an angiogram or most of all uh, coronary by bypass grafting, the African-American male in that set of identical circumstances is one-third to one-half as likely to be afforded that technique and that therapy. And that's simply indicative of a whole range of diagnoses and treatments which are distributed differentially by race in our society, even when these other factors are controlled for. And so as one of the barriers we continue to have to confront in health as in other areas of our life, uh, covert individual and institutional racism. Uh, we were asked in what ways have health and health care suffered because of the denial of other human rights, and I think this is uh, one of the prior uh, priority and most important areas. And then we were asked to talk about the right to health care, and you've already heard 
some of the figures, and I will give you just a few more. But I'd like to begin with a report of the U.S. Commission on Bioethics, the Presidential Commission, a few years ago, addressing this question and said, there is no right to health care in the United States, but there is a social obligation to provide it. In the current shabby terms of political rhetoric, I suggest that that is a hair-splitting, evasive, indeed impeachable statement. <laughs> Uh, but it is one that has consequences, uh, indeed, uh, for uh, our own people. A social obligation smacks of noblesse oblige. It has no roots. It is not enforceable. It can be taken away. It is not a right. It is not an entitlement. And we all know that our country is alone among the industrialized nations in not assuring a right to health care. That is universal coverage and an entitlement of everyone in the population to health care without regard to income, age, residence, ethnicity, and all of the other variables. We are alone in tying health insurance to employment and to the commercial marketplace in increasing measure. That's the first step, in fact, in what has been going on in the commodification of health care, its treatment as a market commodity rather than as a social good and a national interest. And why is no health care coverage or limited or partial coverage so important? Because in our current system, lack of health insurance is not just associated with poor health. It also leads to poor health, to diminished well-being, to greater morbidity, to reduced life expectancy. Uh, let me just uh, read you what's happened, two items of what's happened over these uh, last few years. Uh, <clears throat> mortality and mortality uh, by uh, the, the gap in mortality between people at different income and socioeconomic levels has increased enormously between 1960 and 1986, and that's a trend that is continuing on to the present. Black, white, maternal mortality, infant mortality, and other measures show an increasing gap. Um, most of you know of the study by McCord and Freeman that documents that a middle-aged male in central Harlem, where I teach, uh, has less chance of reaching 65 than a middle-aged man in Bangladesh. The poverty rate for young children in the United States has increased by 25% between 1979 to 83 and 1992 to 1996. We have millions of children in poverty under age six. We are the only country in the industrialized world that does not provide universal prenatal care for all of the other talk uh, that we hear about the rights of the fetus. Uh, these figures are uh, uh, intensified indeed by what Douglas Massey has called American apartheid. Our cities are now more segregated than they were in 1960. Asthma has become a ghetto disease in consequence of uh, those environmental concerns. And if we look at the blood levels of young children, blood lead levels of young children, elevated blood lead levels among blacks, this is a national survey, 11%, Hispanics 4.8%, whites 2.9%. And I take that as a marker for all kinds of other inequities that time does not permit us to discuss. Finally, you heard the figures about those who are uninsured. We know some of the consequences, the projection for the uninsured is that it will be 47 million eight years from now. That is one in every five Americans. And that is under a present system uh, in which venture capital is the driving force in the determinations of medical care, in which the safety net is shrinking, in which we have risk selection rather than any conception of the commons. These all need to be recognized for what they are. They are violations of fundamental human rights and of the promises of the Charter. Yes, we have made promise in, in progress in the years since the Charter was written, but we have a long, long way yet to go here at home. And in the last decade, we have been moving in the wrong direction. Those are some of the challenges that confront us now. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. How y'all doing? All right. 
When I think about Eleanor Roosevelt, I think about her good friend, Mayor McLeod Bethune. And um, I had the good fortune of um, meeting Ms. Bethune. And um, my mother went to Bethune-Cookman College. So as a young girl, I spent a lot of time on that campus. About five years ago, I went back to Cookman and um, I um, was touring Mrs. Bethune's house. And uh, the second floor, she has a room there where Eleanor Roosevelt slept. And when I first saw it, I thought, well, it's kind of weird, you know, they're showing the room where Eleanor Roosevelt slept. And then I thought, but Billy, you're looking at that with 90s eyes. And you have to look at that with 40s eyes. That it was a pretty big deal for Eleanor Roosevelt to go to Daytona Beach and decide to stay with Mira McLeod Bethune. And it was a pretty big deal for Mira McLeod Bethune to have Eleanor Roosevelt stay at her house. These were two very powerful women who were doing very daring things during a time that it was pretty scary to even think those thoughts in the Deep South. So we're talking about some power here. And so what I have done is I have evoked the spirit of both of these women to come and dwell with us in this house this night so that when you leave here, this is not just another forum that you came to and you got some information. Because let me tell you, we have serious problems. We need change. We need institutional change. And we don't have time for y'all to come out here and have a nice evening in Boston. We don't have time for that. And so they are here with us. I want to talk about about three or four areas where there are gaps. Now we all know we have a good medical system technologically. They can keep anything alive forever. They can make things. They can do all kinds of things. They're almost ready to cure diabetes. You know what I'm saying? That's what I heard tonight just before I left. So we are not talking about that part of what it is we have. But what we have to know is if we are going to go around the world touting that we have the best health care system in the world, then we need to start acting like it. And so activists like me are saying, you need to live up to the full measure of your claims. And as of right now, we are flunking. And let me tell you, we are flunking in areas where we could be successful. No system means a thing if it can't be delivered to the people. No system means a thing if it does not impact and change the lives of the people who have the least among us. Not the ones who have the most among us. They can get it no matter what, but the ones who have the least among us. Let us look at some very troubling areas that we have. Let's look at drug abuse, substance abuse, in which we are a nation that is in total denial. We have not even done what a lot of the users have done, which is come to deal with the problem of addiction. We are acting like it's not even alive, even around. And I bet you, I bet you there's not four people in this room whose lives have not been touched by addiction. It is a problem, y'all. Get your heads out of the sand. Our government supposed to be waging a war on drugs. This is the most pitiful war I have ever seen in my life. You ever seen a war like this? <laughs> Mike Wallace in 60 Minutes and all of them can go down to the border and figure and film drugs coming in and big semi-trailers across the border and everything and, and, and it can't be stopped? Something is seriously wrong, but there is no political will. There is no pressure from us to do something about it. We need to have treatment centers on every corner. We need a, we need a treatment center for every liquor store that we have for every bank that we have. And everybody is all wallowing around in the stock market and what it's doing, and every five minutes people say, what did the stock market do today? What did the stock market do today? It is gonna be for naught if we don't take time to take care of our people and take care of us and deal with the problems of addiction. The second thing I wanna to touch briefly on is um, environmental justice. 
We are all suffering from the not in my backyard syndrome. And what is happening, we get toxic dumps being placed mostly in communities of color. I, I, I was doing work down in Pennsylvania in Chester, right outside of Philadelphia. Chester is a, is, a, is a town that had a lot of factories, a lot of industry. Factories closed up, the middle and the upper class moved out. The town, in order to survive, they've got seven of these incinerators that take in all of the trash from the fame um, main line. They haul it in there. The children are sick. The children are dying. And everybody is acting like it's not an issue. It is not okay for you to allow this to go on in other communities. When you pick up the paper and read about it, you should be over there saying it shouldn't be there. We need to find another way. It is not okay for your garbage to be dumped into neighborhoods of low-income people and people of color. That is unacceptable. It is your responsibility. Another issue that we have to deal with in terms of health care is that even when health care is available, even if it is accept accessible for a lot of people, it's unacceptable because the mistrust is so high. The feelings of alienation, the feelings of being made to feel worse when you go in to seek health care are rampant in communities of color and in communities of people of low incomes. We all have to start speaking for a population of people here who I very seldom ever hear anybody speak about. They'll talk about poor blacks, they'll talk about Latinos, they'll talk about Asians. Nobody ever talks about poor white people. There are a lot of poor white people out there who also are not getting anything that they need. So that the delivery of health care is a very political issue. And I'm saying to you, we need you to think about it in a very different way. We need so need to deal with our mental health. We need to deal with our mental well-being. We are a nation that tries to act like we don't have anybody that's living under extreme stress. And there ain't a one of you in here who's not tired. If you say, how are you feeling right now? You say, I'm tired. <laughs> You absolutely, you go away and you stay away on a two-week vacation and you come back to work and you're there two days and you say, what happened to it? I'm exhausted again. We're all working too much. The stress is too high. We live very complicated, complex lives that I don't know that it's necessary. And I don't know that it's absolutely needed. And that is also killing us. I want to close with a word that we live in a very diverse nation. This nation is made up of all kinds of people, all races, and of all colors. And what we have to do is learn each other's struggle. We need to be able to articulate the struggle of the Native Americans, of the Asian Americans of the Latin Americans, of everybody who is here. We need to know that if you're going to be in this movement about change. And we need to break down some of this racism, this sexism, this classism, this homophobia, and all of these other isms. They get in the way. And they keep us from doing our very best thinking and rise into the occasion in the way that we could. Here in the United States, we have a fabulous opportunity. We have an opportunity in all of our diversity to come together as a nation of people to show the world how you learn to live and work and play together and hold hands with each other. Please, I beg you, do something when you leave here tonight.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack and, and Billy. The next big issue our panels are going to deal with tonight is child labor. And uh, Eleanor Roosevelt took an interest in labor issues throughout her life. Uh, especially, she adopted the goal of the living wage, which is something which we in this country have yet to attain. Uh, this formula appears in several articles of the Universal Declaration. It means an income that covers the basics of life, housing, clothing, education, recreation, emergency help sickness, as we've just heard. Uh, and Eleanor never, never imagined that the way to help families support themselves was to put their children to work. Indeed, when the child labor amendment permitting federal limitation on work by people under 18 was up for ratification by the states, she had this to say, children must not grow up undernourished. We must set something up to pr preserve uh, the race of the future out of pure self-interest. We should keep the children out of the labor market as long as possible. And to those of us interested in the better development of our children, the child labor amendment must be ratified. These words are as true on the international level as they are on the local level in Massachusetts and in the US. The kind of world we live in tomorrow will develop, depend to a large extent on how well we can get children around the world treated today. And with that, let me introduce the two panelists who will be looking at the issue of how responsible Americans can deal with the worldwide problem of child labor. And of course, child labor in the US is not an issue that's, that's yet entirely solved. Uh, our first panelist is uh, David Parker. He's a physician specializing in occupational medicine. He's the author of Stolen Dreams, a book about child labor which features his photographs over five years of children working in a variety of occupations in the US, Mexico, Thailand, Indonesia, and India. And his interest grew out of the, the effects on health of uh, the occupation of children uh, who are made to work. And then uh, Ferris Harvey, seated on the other side of David, he's the executive director of the International Labor Rights Fund and has worked actively in Washington for the past 18 years to broaden US human rights laws, to include protection of workers' rights, and to secure compliance with the labor rights provisions in US trade law. So he's also the co-chair of the Child Labor Coalition and serves as coordinator of the Alliance for Responsible Trade. Uh, I look forward to hearing from these next two panelists. I think we're gonna start uh, with David who has some slides. I think if some people here can't see the slide projector, I'm going to put one on. I think in the front, you might need to move to the back, otherwise you're not going to see. During the American industrial e era, the need for labor drew the youngest of children and workers into the labor force. Without safety provisions or fresh air, children were forced to lurk long, hard hours without rest and for little compensation. The pale, gaunt face of the child was brought to the attention of the American people, not only by labor leaders like Samuel Gompers, but by writers such as Upton Sinclair and photographers such as Lewis Hine. After decades of struggle, the United States gradually began to implement child labor laws. Eight years ago, I began to study the effect of work on the health of adolescents in Minnesota. It was surprising to find an almost complete void of information on health problems encountered by young workers in the United States. Furthermore, like many people, I believed that child labor had largely vanished from the world and did not realize that the International Labor Office estimated that approximately 250 million children around the world still labor, labor in order to sustain their basic needs. In fact, a more accurate estimate might be that over 500 million children, or almost one out of three children between the ages of five and 16 years of age, still work. In addition to a multitude of conventions set forth by the International Labor Office, these children are protected under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 4 prohibits slavery in all its forms, and Article 23 allows for just remuneration. The children seen in the next two photographs, including the one that's there now, work on deep sea fishing platforms off the islands of Java and Sumatra. We have the next slide up there now? 
Held captive for periods of up to six months, these children eat little more than fish, rice, and water. There are an estimated 1,200 such platforms, each with four to 12 children. Article 24 allows for rest and leisure. However, over 85% of young leather workers in Calcutta and Dhaka work over 12 hours per day with no vacation. The tanning process is carried out in tumbling barrels, such as the, this one, using chromic acid alkalis, such as trisodium phosphate, borax, and oxalic acid, formaldehyde, and natural and synthetic tanning materials. Article 25 calls for a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being and entitling motherhood and childhood to special care and assistance. This young woman scavenges garbage to eat at the dump site outside of Acapulco. Article 26 allows for free and mandatory education, and Article 29 allows for free development of personality. However, over 50% of children in developing nations do not complete a secondary school education. Practices that violate labor standards, by extension, violate basic human rights. However, nations are largely silent on these issues. In general, work conditions in developing nations are far inferior to those of developed nations. Bekasi, about two-hour drive from Jakarta, is one of the world's largest garbage dumps. Over 10,000 children and adults live and work on the site. Each day, over 30,000 cubic meters of garbage are carted there from Jakarta. During the winter, the waste is soaked under the monsoon rains and then slowly cooked under the equatorial sun. As trucks and tractors indiscriminately plow garbage, children are buried alive on a regular basis. Those who do not succumb to death from injury fall victim to a multitude of bacterial and parasitic diseases. The government of Indonesia, however, refuses to acknowledge the existence of these people. Children scavenge garbage around the world looking for things, things to sell and food to eat. Health problems are compounded for children who are more susceptible to occupational diseases than our adults. For example, children develop dust-related lung diseases, the girls and women in this stone quarry are exposed to extreme levels of dust that place them at risk of developing silicosis and silicotuberculosis. Other children are forced to do arduous work that is well beyond their developmental capacity. A child such as the one seen here, or the girls seen in this photograph, may carry over 2,000 bricks per day, each brick weighing between one and two kilograms. Child carpet weavers suffer from lung problems from working in confined, dusty, dark places. Or perhaps they develop arthritis by the age of 12. One of the most serious forms of abuse is child prostitution, where children are almost certain to develop sexually transmitted diseases and where children are offered protective equipment, it is ridiculously large. And the equipment with which children are asked to work is equally absurd. Deprived of an education, children do monotonous and boring work. This child is making sesame seed oil. And this child pushes a carnival ride in circles until he's exhausted. At seven years of age, this boy stacks thousands of matches onto a small holder each day. And there are hundreds of other tasks that children do. Perhaps the most common of these is agriculture. Each day, each fall, thousands of migrant workers move from eastern to central Turkey to dig potatoes. Other workers migrate to pick cotton. Entire communities live in small plastic tents without potable water and no sanitary facilities. In Morocco, children wander the desert herding camels, and around the world, children are found tending animals. India, southern Nepal, in small shops in South India, children polish metal culinary ware. 
these shops are noisy and dusty. The work is often dangerous and children are not given protective equipment. Luckier children are apprentices who learn trades such as these boys in Morocco. Unlucky children find themselves living and working on the street. In Mexico City, street performers line Avenida Reforma, one of the largest streets in the city. Every fall, children sell tickets in the St. Paul Midway. Sold or given away by their parents, circus children travel long distances and live under adverse conditions, always at risk of sexual exploitation. The Raj Kamal Circus in India has hundreds of such child performers. In closing, I would like to read from a poem from the book, India, A Million Mutinies Now. I was born where the sun becomes weak and slowly becomes extinct, extinct. In the embrace of night, I was born on the footpath in a rag. Thank you. It's always such a pleasure to be with David because he's already said much of what I had intended to say, and he's done it with pictures. Um, I envy him his skill with the camera as well as his insights. I was asked to say a few words on what has changed in the last 50 years, and you've been reminded that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was drafted only 10 years after the United States for the first time banned child labor. Uh, and it is striking that within that recent memory, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights makes no mention of child labor per se. Uh, I think there was not a great deal of consciousness of the full extent of the practice around the world at that time, uh, because the practice is not new. But the elements of the, of the Universal Declaration speak very much to the causes of child labor, and if we are to address uh, the problem of child labor, we have to not only deal with the effects, but we have to address the causes. Article 1, in its eloquent opening, says all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and status, and, and rights, sorry. But to 6 million children in India and Pakistan, those words would come as, as much a surprise today as they would have 50 years ago. For 50 years after those words were adopted, this number of children are still born into families in bondage. From the moment they utter their first cry, they are property rather than persons. Fated by their caste status and the fact that in some distant past, some relative, some ancestor incurred a debt, marriage or a funeral debt, their lives are spent from as early as three or four years of age in a servitude that never ends. Article 4 says that no one shall be held in slavery or servitude, but hundreds of thousands of children in West Africa lack the protection of this article, as an active slave trade has now developed re-emerging in the selling of children from the interior through the ports of Gabon and elsewhere into servitude and households throughout North Africa and the Middle Eastern region under conditions as unbearable as those that prevailed in the notorious slave trade of the 17th to the 19th century. An AIDS pandemic in Africa is contributing to the supply of children orphaned uh, by this absolutely unbelievable disaster. But the conditions of slavery into which <coughs> children are are being lured, sold, or wandering uh, are almost beyond comprehension. Slavery is not dead. The right to a just and favorable remuneration is, in, is uh, enshrined in Article 23. Everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favorable conditions of work. Everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration, ensuring for himself and his family an existence worthy of human dignity. Tell that to the 160,000 or more migrant children working in the fields producing the food we eat in the United States. 
virtually all of them work without registration of their own employment on their father's social security number, augmenting the family income because in 1938, when we established Fair Labor Standards Act, in order to secure passage, we excluded farm workers from many of the protections that and in the uh, National Labor Relations Act. And so farm workers in this country have never had the adequate protection of the right to collective bargaining. As a result, their wages are below subsistence, no matter how hard they work, and their children work off the books in order to help them make ends meet. Work made necessary by the lack of adequate wages or the right to organize of adults brings at least 160,000 children in our country into conditions of, of employment and work uh, which are as unsafe as any known anywhere else. Exposure to dangerous pesticides is the number one killer of children in farm work and our government has yet to engage in any study of the impact on children of pesticides. All pesticide level studies have been done on adults. Uh, only now, beginning in the next few months, uh, will the uh, Occupation Safety, Healthy Administra Safety and Health Administration begin a study together with EPA uh, of the impact of pesticide exposure on children. When children attend school, it is often for a few weeks in one school and then they move on to another. As a result, 63% of farm worker children in this country drop out of school before they complete their compulsory education. Article 25 says that motherhood and childhood are entitled to special care and assistance, but childhood is completely denied to children who are forced at an early age into prostitution as tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, of, of girls in Nepal uh, and, and in the poorer parts of India are enforced uh, into prostitution uh, to serve the uh, tourist trades uh, and to serve uh, the brothels of Calcutta, Bombay, and other cities. Similar conditions exist for children in Burma, who now have replaced most of the children from Thailand who are in the brothels and the sex trade industry in Thailand. Article 26, everyone has the right to an education. Countries where basic education is not free and compulsory are the most likely to have a high incidence of child labor. And regions of countries where education is devalued have a higher level of child labor than those regions that don't. For example, in India, which does not have compulsory education, even though for 51 years that has been enshrined in its constitution as a basic right, more than one-third of the children of India have no access to basic education. It is for that reason alone that, the Uni that UNICEF believes that uh, the number of working children in India probably approximates 100 million rather than the 55 million which is normally given. Overall, the causes of child labor are not poverty. They are poverty compounded by policy and prejudice. Children who are working are inevitably the children of prejudiced populations, whether they are migrant workers in the United States or low caste Hindus or Muslims in India or indigenous people in Latin America. Inevitably, it is the people who are subjects of prejudice who are the child workers of our world. These practices are not new, but what is new is the integration of very harsh practices of child labor into a global economy through manufacturing, through tourism, and through migration. And a growing consciousness that these violations of the rights of children are intolerable. And there's where the good news begins. In the 1980s, a growing consumer awareness, first in Europe and then in the United States, led to a beginning of a change, first in the ILO, uh, to adopt a special program by 1991 to address the problems of child labor, first in a few countries in Asia, now in 26 countries around the world. 
the governmental responses to consumer pressures because they were focused on export goods like carpets and then later on soccer balls and uh, surgical instruments. Um, the first governmental response was denial. I can remember dealing with governments who adamantly insisted that child labor was not a problem in their country. The second response was to say that that was a cultural norm of their own country. And when that didn't wash with consumers and product uh, sales continued to decline, the third defense was that this is our business and not your business. And when that didn't wash, then governments began to take up the question of how to deal with child labor in the export sectors. And so we have in India a program developed by the government to uh, deal with child labor in the carpet sector and in a few other export sectors. In Bangladesh, garments are a major importer or are a utilizer of child labor, and a program was developed there. In Pakistan, 70 to 75 percent of the world's soccer balls are made in Pakistan. A program is underway now to end child labor in that industry. But the vast bulk of children are not working in export industries. And so consumer pressures by themselves are primarily effective in raising the consciousness and the conscience of government officials to move out of the sloth of tradition, poverty, and a variety of other excuses. Private initiatives have made an effort also primarily in the export industries. Rugmark, which is a program I serve as a president of the U.S. chapter on, is a program to uh, label carpets in India, Pakistan, and Nepal that are made by uh, adult labor rather than child labor, uh, and to make those available on the market and to use a feedback from the sales of those to provide rehabilitation programs and uh, educational programs for the children in the regions producing those carpets. Other private initiatives like codes of conduct and enforcement mechanisms have created a, a high level of awareness among some consumer, producer, consumer good producers in the United States like Nike and Liz Claiborne and others uh, who have sworn to uh, vigilantly walk, uh, watch against child labor uh, in the production of their goods. Most of those programs are just getting underway. Um, there are also government initiatives that have been taken uh, by the United States, uh, again, focusing primarily on imported goods. Uh, last year, uh, Senator Harkin and Congressman Sanders were uh, successful in introducing legislation that applied the 1930 uh, Tariff Act to goods made by forced or, or indentured child labor. And it's now illegal to import into this country goods made by forced or indentured child labor. Um, after one week of that law, we filed a complaint uh, to bar the import of all carpets from India, Pakistan, and Nepal unless they could demonstrate they were made without child labor. And after six months of dilly-dallying, uh, the administration has now assigned a high-level high team uh, to enforce that law. And we can now begin to see, I think, some serious enforcement of that law. Uh, but what is needed uh, is a much broader range of events. When the United States speaks in international circles about child labor, its credibility is challenged by virtue of the fact that we are the only organized government in the world that has not ratified the, child, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The only other government which is not organized at the present moment is Somalia. Uh, we have not ratified the basic ILO conventions that deal with the issue of child labor. There is basic need for the reform of U.S. labor law. If we are to deal with the cause of child labor in the United States, we must deal with the causes of adult worker poverty. And we cannot do that without reform of our own labor laws. And we must increase the enforcement of those laws. Consumers must have a reliable way of knowing when they are buying products made by child labor and when they are buying products made by companies that are making a serious effort to end child labor. Those efforts are underway. Hopefully, within the next two or three years, there will be a significant number of goods on the market 
that will be labeled for consumers to know. And finally, we must focus on development policy. Countries that are abandoning education for military uh, expenditures, as India and Pakistan both are, need to redress their priorities. And international development assistance can be a factor in assisting that to happen, not just by providing direct educational assistance, but by conditioning, educa conditioning assistance to give priority to those regions of the country and those populations which are most child labor prone, and to making conditions of establishing basic educational programs a condition for other kinds of educational assistance. The World Bank, which has primarily funded the development of intellectual infrastructure for multinational corporations in its educational funding, is now just barely beginning to look at the need to provide assistance to the poorest of, of uh, populations and to basic education. Uh, I have probably run way past my time, uh, but there is much we can do, uh, and child labor 50 years from now need not be cataloged in the way that 50 years after the UDHR was established, uh, it still is today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we're going to move now on to the third part of our panels, uh, which is the women's panel. And it's, this is one of those areas where women have been supposed to have equal rights for so long, and yet look around you. Uh, in many arenas, those equal rights don't exist in this country. And one of the linkages I've noticed between some, our four speakers so far is the economic linkage. I mean, that's clear to me. You can't just take one of these rights and separate it out and say, we're going to have this right, we're not going to have that right. And they all seem to be based on a common substrate, and that's equality, economic equality among uh, people. And that's not something that we enjoy in this country at this moment. Certainly, when we came back from Beijing, we observed studies in this state that show that the poorest of our people are women. And that's, I suppose, no surprise to those who have been in the movement for a long time, but it was a bit of a surprise to me. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to say some of the things Eleanor Roosevelt had to say on this topic. When she was uh, at the UN deliberations on the draft convention on the political rights of women, she said, as most of you know, the subject of this convention, the suffrage for women, very close to my heart. I believe in active citizenship for men and women equally as a simple matter of right and justice. I believe we will have better government in all our countries when men and women discuss public issues together. So uh, I know that's a huge and important goal. But how can men and women discuss equal their political issues together when the women are really not at the table. You know, Women have the vote, but they're not there in the legislatures where they should be. They're not in the appointed positions. They're not in the elected positions. We have two more in this state than we ever had after the last election, but uh, still not doing too well in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, what has actually changed for women, for better and for worse, at home and abroad since 1948? Uh, why so little economic power, why so little corporate power finds its way into women's hands? Why have we hardly begun to acknowledge much less conquer the horror, the locked-in horror of domestic violence that makes victims of so many of our women in this country? Uh, I'd like to introduce two women who will tackle these questions and others in the discussion on the battle for women's rights at home here in the United States. Swanee Hunt is our first panelist. She's director of the Women in Public Policy program here and another co-sponsor of tonight's event. In the past, she's been the American ambassador to Austria, where she worked extensively with Bosnian women and uh, women in post-communist countries across Eastern Europe. After 40 regional trips, she became a specialist in that particular field and culminated her work in a major piece called Vital Voices, Women in Democracy. So uh, I'd like to introduce you to Swanee Hunt. And I'm briefly going to introduce Decima before. Uh, 
you get up, Swan. Desmond Williams is a professor of sociology at Brandeis, formerly the Grenadian ambassador to the Organization of American States. We met at many of the post-Beijing forums and panels beginning in 1995, and since then I haven't stopped learning from her. Uh, over the past decade, Dr. Williams has argued for more concerted international action to improve the status of women, and her current field is research in Grenada on women's leadership roles in socioeconomic well-being and on the problem of the globalized economy, how the globalized economy affects women in this country and elsewhere. So Desima and Swani, look forward to hearing uh, from this panel. Thank you. Uh, I think probably 90% of the people here would say that Eleanor Roosevelt is a role model to you, a heroine. I see the heads nodding. Well, I have to tell you, she certainly is for me. And there is also someone else here in this room who is a role model and a heroine. And it is Samantha Power. And Samantha is true. And Greg, you should feel very, 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 very lucky to have Samantha there running this program for you. She is terrific. Look at this panel. This is one of the best panels I've ever been to at Harvard. And Samantha, congratulations, even if I am on it myself. <laughs> As we were coming out, Billy said to me, I've known Billy Avery a lot of years, and Billy said to me, I have no idea what I'm going to say. I said, you know what, Billy, there are a lot of people up there who are going to give a lot of information. We're going to have pictures. We're going to have statistics. Give us some soul. And didn't she do it? So thank you, Billy. All right. I was particularly struck with the reminder that Eleanor Roosevelt would rather light a candle than curse the darkness, particularly because Desima and I, when we were talking about how we would address this very large issue of women, uh, we were talking about all the bad news that's out there. And, and, and Desima said, let's be sure that we give some good news, too. Mm -hmm. So you'll hear from me a bit of a mix. Uh, there's an awful lot of bad news out there in the statistics. And why should we care? Why should we care about what's happening with women? Well, you could say we should care because of fairness. In corporate America, women were earn for comparable work. They earn uh, three quarters of what men were, uh, earn. And there's a wider discrepancy for women of color. And less than 5% of the senior executive positions are held by women. And when I hear those kinds of statistics, like you, my blood starts boiling, and I say, it's unfair. Or we could care about women as victims, and we could approach this on humanitarian grounds, and, and there's plenty of darkness out there. 70% of the world's 1.3 billion poor are women. That's about 900 women who have an average daily income of less than $1. 900 million women earn less than a dollar a day. And with rural women, absolute poverty has increased 50% in the last two decades. And you hear those kinds of st statistics and you just want to moan because that is darkness indeed. Women being treated unfairly or women as victims. I would like to recast this conversation if I may because you know about the fairness issue. You know about women as victims. I would like to say a word about women as the stabilizers in society. And to do so, I would just like to tell you two scenes, and I'll try to be very brief. One is Susan mentioned that I've been very active working in Bosnia. Let me tell you a little bit about Bosnia and women. During the war, even when, when there were just the, the rumblings of war, women started organizing to try to prevent the war. And it had nothing to do with ethnic lines. They crossed all those lines. And they created 50 women's associations across this rather small country. It's a country of 4 million people. And they belied, absolutely belied this notion of those people have hated each other for centuries. They're never going to be able to live together. The women were organizing constantly together. 
Four months after the peace was signed in Dayton, they had a conference with 500 women from all over the country. They had to cross roadblocks, all kinds of obstacles to come together, a multi-ethnic conference. And since then, there have been all kinds of different sorts of conferences for for women starting businesses, or this March, there was a conference in Bosnia. 200 women came from 25 political parties to Sarajevo, and 40% of the, the women who came to Sarajevo, 40% came from Republika Srpska. Now, if you had gone to the State Department and said, we'd like to plan this conference and have 40% of the attendees from Republika Srpska come into Sarajevo, they said, what, you've been smoking. Frankly, no one would imagine that in the formal diplomatic circles, but the women can do it. They know how to cross those lines. And as far as I'm concerned, they are the great hope of Bosnia. They created so much pressure at this conference in March that a ruling was passed by the Electoral Commission that required a certain number of women candidates in the top slots of every political party for the September elections. And the number of women in the parliaments now in Bosnia and Herzegovina increased in one year from less than 3% to almost 30%. And that's because the grassroots organizing of the women across the multi-ethnic lines. So I look at Bosnia, which is a mess. It is a mess. And I see women there unwilling to give up, unwilling to give in, and determined to stabilize that society. Now, why do they do that? Well, you know and I know that one of the reasons is because they have this sense of family and the future. And that is the second point I want to make. Women as stabilizers in the society, they are nurturing the future. So let me go from Bosnia, from Sarajevo, to come here to this country, to Baltimore. I want to take you into an apartment of a young woman named Rose. She fits a lot of statistics. As you know, 57% of the Americans in poverty are female. And almost 80% of the people who are living in the families in public housing, those are headed up by women. So Rose is not an anomaly. Rose is one of many, many, many in our society. And a friend of mine was a, a, a worker with a, uh, she was a Baltimore policewoman. And she worked on child abuse and neglect. And she went up to see Rose because Rose was gonna possibly have taken away from her the light of her life, Julianne. Julianne was three years old. And my friend was going to tell Rose, that in fact she hadn't pulled her life together. They knew she'd been leaving Julianne in the apartment alone while Rose was out on the street. She was earning money on the streets to support a habit, the, the habits that, that Billy was talking about that decimate these low-income communities. And my friend said, I have never walked such up uh, such tall steps as I did in that dilapidated apartment building, walking up to knock on the door of Rose to tell her we're going to take Julianne away. And I knocked on the door, and the door opened, and there stood Rose. And Julianne was right behind her, peeking around her skirt. And Rose said, hello, let me show you what I have. And she got this big textbook on child psychology. And she'd gone to the university bookstore and paid, what, $40 for this giant textbook on child psychology. She held it out and she said, do you think it'll help? Of course, Rose couldn't read. Now, how many Julianne's are out there? And how many roses are out there thinking, I'll do anything, anything to save the life of my daughter, to support my daughter. And we're not giving Rose what she needs to secure and nurture the future. Well, is it going to change? 
We know that it takes pressure from the grassroots, but it also takes pressure from the top to make change. And that's what Eleanor Roosevelt understood. So the darkness is that only 24 women have been elected to positions of head of state of government throughout history. And the light is that over half of those are since the year 1990. And expanding that light, we here at the Kennedy School have the privilege to host the Council of Women World Leaders. And I can't help but think, wouldn't Eleanor be pleased? Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I want to wish everyone happy Universal Human Rights Day. I put up a sign on the uh, door of my department building today which said essentially that, happy 50th birthday. And one of my colleagues came to me and said, I'm not quite 50 yet. And I said, you are today. <laughs> <laughs> so happy birthday. It belongs to all of us. And if you don't have your own personal copy, you should get it. And you should put it in the stockings of all your favorite people. I can give you a phone number where you can get a free copy. It just looks like this. And you can stick it in the stockings. The number in Minneapolis is, tell them I asked the phone, 612-341-2000. Six one two three four one eight zero eight four. It's called Human Rights USA Resource Center. Tell them you want ten. Give it around. From here, I am also sending greetings to the women and men brave enough to raise me and braver still to admit that they did. <laughs> These are the people in my hometown in Granbra, in Grenville, Grenada. I don't know if you'll ever get to know that I'm doing this today. I want to spend, send very special greetings to my family because so often when we are far from home and these big moments pass, we pass it away from home. But I also want to invoke the spirit of my family today. Um, I want to say a very special happy birthday to my students from Brandeis University, um, some of whom are here and who are taking the risk of being associated with me. I want to thank the Institute. I'm very happy that you are having this event, and I hope that we can continue to spread the word, spread the spirit, spread the good wishes and the good energy that we'll take from it today. I want to thank everybody for coming. Today also, I, I learned that today is the birthday of Emily Dickerson. Uh, she came from, um, from Amherst. She would have been 168, I think, today. And um, she was a poet laureate, I'm told. So, you know, we're in good company. We could invoke her, too. Absolutely. Um, and I can't wait to go home and put on my radio. As I, In fact, it stays on stations where I can get BBC, and this is long before. <laughs> I, I can't get Radio Havana anymore, so I don't know what's going on in the Caribbean. But I do get BBC, and I'm sure that they will give us a synopsis of Amatra Sen who is the Nobel laureate this year for economics, for development economics, and that has quite a bit to do with what I think is an important task in this world. And I, I finally must say, yes, mixed, but overall thrilled that um, the law lords, my good friend Tony Gifford over there, Lord Gifford, and um, the, the, yeah, and the other, uh, uh, dignified jurists and politicians in England has handed the international human rights community, but the Chilean people in particular, a uh, sterling victory. A victory that says we do not have, no matter who we are, impunity to take or distort the lives of others. Uh, 
uh, I think the question we ask is, um, you know, why we have the, uh, what is the promise the United Nations have made to women? That's my question. And why was it necessary that the United Nations should make a promise to women, assuming that it did? <laughs> um, first of all, it did make a promise to us. It made a promise to all the peoples of the world. I want to recall that when the UN was founded and we just celebrated 50 years in 1995, um, at its founding, the UN was uh, over, over 100 nations today were colonies. Only, in, for example, in the continent of Africa, only Ethiopia and Liberia were present to sign the charter. In the Caribbean, where I come from, only Cuba, Dominican Republic, and Haiti were independent and present. So we are a people, we are a new people. We have grown up with the UN, we have grown up, and we are coming of age with the Declaration. And the promise was, as the Charter says, for peace, for development, for never again the scourges of war, <coughs> and for the vision of a better life. But of course, that was a very limited promise, and we have had since then to make several others encoded in the Declaration three years later, and a plethora of instru instruments and institutions at our disposal. So I think that it's clear that there's a promise that has been made, but why? The Decolonization Committee of the United Nations and its work helped to tell us why. We now have a sense of self-determination, not yet universal, but 90% on its way. And I certainly pray, hope, and work towards the day when not only South Africa and Eritrea and Namibia will be independent and self-determining, but clearly the remaining peoples, the Sahrawi people of West Africa, Palestinian people, anybody in Puerto Rico, wherever they want to be self-determined in, in whatever form they choose. I think we also know from the United Nations Development Program that whereas two-thirds of the peoples of the world lived in abject poverty 30 years ago, now one out of every five. So we've made progress, but yet not enough. When it comes to women, we have had to make very specific promises. Now, it is true that Eleanor Roosevelt um, attended and chaired this glorious uh, organization and, uh, in, uh, which set up the declaration. But it is also true that, and, and I'm quoting her, she said, in view of the variety of tasks which women performed so notably and valiantly during the war, World War II, we are gratified that 17 women delegates and advisors representing 11 member states are taking part at the signing of this new phase of international effort. We hope their participation in the work of the United Nations organizations may grow and may increase in insight and in skill." End of quote. And so from the very beginning, women were there. But it was necessary in 1979 to craft, and in 1981 to pass the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination, the uh, Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDA. And if you've never heard about the CEDA, C-E-D-A-W, it is the Magna Carta of the women's movement, the international women's movement. And it is, an, it is a companion to the Declaration. And what the CEDA says is that all forms of discrimination against women must be outlawed. And over 154 countries have signed it. I think it's the second most signed document after the International Convention on the Rights of the Child, which many countries um, have signed. The CEDA has come 
this close in the United States to passage, only this close. And I think that the Congress might be occupied with some more intriguing issues uh, than they currently are if they contemplate the signing of the CEDAW. I think the promise of the UN to the women of the world is frustrated by many shortcomings. And we are speaking here in the United States. So I will speak about the frustration of the United States policy uh, toward the women of the world. I'm not going to make anything unpleasant for anybody. Um, I simply want to say that where power lies, so does responsibility. And the United States has not always supported the goals of the United Nations in a manner which can allow it to meet the needs of the women of the world. For example, you well recall in, in the 1980s, the, and I can't find any other word except to say the open attack that the, the, the then administration waged with UNESCO, refusing to fund UNESCO until it fell into compliance with US policy. That didn't help, the funding of education for women and girls. And immediately now, the US, uh, in refusing, or the Congress more specifically rather than the administration, in refusing to pay its arrears over a billion dollars uh, at, the, at the moment certainly frustrates the rapid uh, advance of development funding and development programming targeted at the poorest uh, of the world who are women and children. I think in summary, I want to suggest that the glass is half full. In many ways, we have attained silver. You know, we've done pretty well in 50 years. The promise has been articulated. It has been met. It has been embraced. When we were in Beijing, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, it depends on whose figures you take, except Jesse Helms, <laughs> we say 50,000. <laughs> Journalists, professors, politicians, researchers, activists, disabled, all women of the world who embraced the call that they should take charge of their destiny. And this, in doing so, women are fulfilling Article 30 of the Declaration, which states, and I quote, that nothing, excuse me, Article uh, 28, that everyone, everyone is entitled to a social and international order in which the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. So I see the challenge before us as moving from silver to gold. Uh, the goal or the gold, however you think of it. Because I think we are living in a regime that my students are sick of hearing me characterize as gendered global apartheid. Gendered global apartheid, and it isn't possible to give you the statistics to uh, identify this concept. Suffice it to say that, as already been said by Swani, 1.3 billion people in the world live on the verge of death on a daily basis. 35,000 children die every day from diseases that are curable and from hunger. It's as if 300 jumbo jets crash every day. That's the scope of it. And the, of this 1.3 billion, 70% are women and their dependents, small children, the elderly, the sick, the disabled, those abandoned in refugee camps. 80% um, of the victims of AIDS are people of color in Africa, in Asia, children, women, and yet 80% of the spending on AIDS are in the North, where we have a smaller percentage of those infected. UNICEF has just released a report on the state of the world via the state of the, the, the lives of the children of the world. Pretty dismal. So the question is what should we do if this promise that we have embraced is to make sense and to be, to be fulfilled? I want to recall here another Nobel, uh, Nobel laureate, 
uh, uh, Garcia Marquez, you know, in 1992, I think we realized we were coming to the end of the century. And at the time, I think it's Time Magazine did a, an interview with famous musicians and writers and scientists around the world and asked of them, what is the single most important idea we should begin to cultivate as we go into the new century? And Ga Garcia Marquez said, you know, the most important thing that we can think about and do is to transfer the management of the global system from the hands of men who have squandered it for millennia the, to, the, to the hands of women. And we've just about begun that process with, with the leadership movement of women, particularly in the state sector. We've got an enormous more to do to break the gridlock at the global level that is um, uh, more and more managed by not just the market, I don't think the market is in control, I think the monopoly is in control, and I think we have to work on that. And, um, well, my time is up, so thank you very much. Now, uh, really, we want to hear from the audience, so I'm going to say thanks. thank you very much to our panelists. And to say that now we actually have 20 minutes or, or slightly more to hear from you. There's a couple of microphones. There's one right here and there's one over there. And I'd like to specifically thank our first questioner, Len Rubenstein, who's head of um, the International Physicians for Human Rights. Thank, thank you, you very much. I would just like to first thank the panel. I think everyone in this room uh, shares with me how remarkable your presentations were and how stimulating they were to all of us. Uh, I also want to make it easier for everyone. Uh, you don't have to call 617 to get a copy of the Universal Declaration. You can get one on this table. So I, I ask you if you'd like to take that. Uh, the wrongs that you all discussed, uh, all of you in one way or the other, discussed them in terms of human rights. And the subtext of what you were all saying was that we can't begin to address the problem of child labor or oppression of women, or of lack of drug treatment facilities, or lack of access to health care, unless we see these wrongs as violations of human rights. And when we celebrated Eleanor Roosevelt throughout this evening, there's a kind of subtext there, too, that this is American leadership, and we take inspiration not only from her, but from our own Bill of Rights, our own 14th Amendment. And yet there's a paradox. Uh, today's Washington Post, today's New York Times, didn't even run an editorial or a news article acknowledging the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Ferris points out we haven't uh, and, uh, ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We haven't ratified the Convention of, on Women's Rights. We haven't ratified even one of the basic covenants of social, economic, and cultural rights, much less the more cutting edge issues like the uh, International Criminal Court or the uh, ban on landmines. The question is, how can we move this country uh, to start thinking of these wrongs as violations of human rights? And I want to ask you specifically to address a quote I read from George Will this morning, who was discussing covenants we did sign, that the U.S. did sign, that in imposed human rights obligations on us. And here's what he wrote. He said, Congress has ratified various agreements that purport to limit what regimes can inflict upon their people. He was writing about Pinochet. But Congress has given no more thought to those agreements' legal force and practical application than Congress gives to proclamations of National Pickle Week. Unfortunately, I agree with what George Will said about what Congress was doing. I might not agree with him about the wisdom of that. I'd like to ask members of the panel to comment on how we can start building a culture in this country that affirms the value of human rights so on the 100th anniversary we'll have a national celebration comparable to what we have on the 4th of July. Who would like to, who would like to be the first? Well, as the outsider, I can always speak, right? <laughs> Um, is it on? I, I have no more insight than the rest of us. I simply think that there is need for a popular movement, for, for people to express agency. 
as Eleanor Roosevelt said, you know, activism, activism on the issues that matter. And I think, for example, the, the, the democratization of international relations is an important issue. It might seem abstract, it's not. Um, secondly, I think the question of women's rights is critical, but it, we must link the, the issues. We can't do anti-racism one place and uh, women's work another place and the environment another place. There has to be a sense that we're building a global community and that every issue of justice has a place within the overall. Um, so I would say those are my two contributions. On the one hand, we must become more active citizens. Movement should be a, a, a joyous experience. And secondly, I think that uh, there should be an integrated approach to the struggle or the movements for justice. Um, I don't want to wait till uh, another 50 years. Uh, and uh, I would rather shoot for 10 years from now. It seems to me uh, we need to confront clearly what we're up against and where the roots are so that we organize appropriately for change. The last time we had that kind of movement, at least in relation to human rights, the kind that's just been described, uh, was the civil rights movements of the 1960s, uh, when there were real social commitments for a while in this country to social justice, to the reduction of inequity, uh, to many of the underpinnings of what we have been talking about tonight. And over the last 20 years, it needs to be very clear uh, that things in many of these dimensions have gone backwards. And I don't mean just in the definition and enforcement of civil rights. I don't mean just uh, the questions of affirmative action. I mean the distribution of incomes, the protection of rights, uh, the distribution of power, uh, whether in health or many of the dimensions we've talked about, the real decision makers in the society are corporate campaign contributors more than any other, to name uh, a, a clear-cut health issue when the tobacco industry was uh, confronted with the possibility of very expensive and real regulation and containment. <laughs> it decided it was cheaper and more effective to bite a Republican Party and a couple of Democrats that they could get besides. And by and large, they were right on both counts. And the point here is that this happens over and over. One of the most compelling batches of new data in the health field uh, has to do with what has been called the Robin Hood Index. Uh, the degree of inequity in the distribution of income and wealth between the top and the bottom. I never understood why it was the Robin Hood Index. I always thought it would be called the Banana Republic Index. Hey. The, difficulty is, <laughs> the difficulty is that this has been going on in the United States for the last 20 years, in which everybody has lost except the top 3 to 5 percent in terms of income and wealth. And that has to do with political power. And that has to do, in turn, that continuum from civil and political rights to social and economic rights uh, to the other human rights that we have been talking about. Uh, and we are going to have to find the way to put together, first, uh, to have these data, these facts, these social trends, and their corollaries in what happens to people's incomes and insurance and housing and all the rest of work, all the rest of what we've talked about recognized, uh, and secondly, to put together coalitions now cleverly divided from their mutual interest and from their self-interest uh, by uh, the protagonists of some of these changes uh, to form these coalitions once again. That's the task. And we tend to do it every 30 to 40 years. We tend to rediscover poverty every 30 to 40 years. Oh, my God, there are poor people around. We've got to do something about it. Uh, and we're a little overdue. Uh, but I don't see any reason why we should despair that we can't do it again. And the important thing, finally, is that it's not any one of these little issues. It's the recognition of the constellation of issues and of the coalition of forces that needs to be put together to do it. And the linkage of these issues, one with the other. Um, yeah. Sir. In an effort 
to contain some um, some country's bad behavior in our. Would you like to get, uh, say who you are? Or? Chris Drew, local community resident. Um, our country has imposed economic sanctions on some number of other small countries, and the presumably, hopefully, unintended consequence is massive disaster for the least able in those countries to to withstand that that effect. Does anybody see any sign that we're starting to question the use of, of economic sanctions and other kinds of economic hostility for those reasons of, of human rights violations? Any this, signs that we're beginning to stop using economic sanctions? Or question, I think. Or question, question them. Yeah. Or ease, or both. Well, I, it seems to me that that questioning goes on uh, a good bit of the time. Uh, and the economic sanctions seem always to be directed at the wrong parties. Um, there have been a few occasions in our past, I think, when economic sanctions were an effective tool to bring about change. And those few occasions were times when domestic movements within the countries where sanctions were being applied were in favor of those sanctions. Uh, and sought the kinds of pressures against governments that were oppressing them. That was true in South Africa. Uh, it is true today in Burma. Uh, it doesn't tend to be true in Iraq, uh, so far as we know. Uh, but that kind of questioning has to go on all the time, and I'm not sure that there's any trend that I see in increasing or decreasing it. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Mangalam Srinivas, and I work as advisor on climate change, but I am an activist in the um, many causes, one of which happens to be human rights, and the third generation feminist and human rights activist, and have stayed poor for these reasons. Um, I uh, wanted to first of all say that uh, the, um, uh, somebody raised the question of econ economic sanctions. While we are uh, holding the light up to ourselves, I think it would be interesting and important to really find out what our role is in the destabilization of human right, uh, rights around the world. There are so many different kinds of rights that have suffered. For example, everyone is now a victim of the market rights of certain corporations. And uh, uh, 20 years ago, when I did a background paper for the United Nations Conference on Science and Technology in Vienna, uh, I um, spoke about Mexican women who were uh, being uh, displaced from their uh, uh, peasantry into working for maquiladoras, and what they were dressing for, and what they were, uh, what they were wearing, how they were expected to come into the office with the high heels and with the American suit, with the American looks and so on. Now this is, to me, is a violation of right, because by violating the right of people to eat their food, to wear the clothes that they want to wear. Look at all of us. I'm the only one in my own clothes. But many of us come from so many different countries, mainly because I'm willing to pay the price for appearing the way that I do. But many in their own countries are not. These are and economic rights, uh, so many rights. Health rights in India, for example. Uh, the women that work in various fields are never paid, particularly midwives, who are working in, uh, in thousands of them, the government tells them, oh, you're acting very noble. It's a very noble cause for you to be in. Look what you're doing. But these are very, very poor women. I would like to propose one thing about uh, the person who spoke a lot about can, India. Can, do, you, do you have a specific question? Well, I like to fill in some gaps. I, I don't want to be the perpetual audience constantly asking questions for the panel because I have information to supply here, which is that uh, to say that it's not just a caste and class oriented. In fact, the highest caste never employs servants. The children, many of us that we sponsor in this university who come from overseas are precisely those obstacles to change in those countries. We celebrate them as leaders right in these universities. And I would suggest that we remove oil from the equation of human rights. Then we would be on everybody, not just on other people who do not have, uh, do not have oils. I have many points to make, but no one asked me for the opinions. Thank you. We, so, we, yeah, we, we'd love to you. talk afterwards, and anybody who would like to, um, to gather right here and talk to you, that'd be wonderful. N another questioner over here, if you could give your name before you ask your question. 
I'm Holly Sargent. I'm, I'm an associate dean here at the Kennedy School. Um, I think one of the things that is most disturbing um, as we're thinking about America's role uh, and our responsibility and whether we have li lived up to this challenge, not only uh, in our own country but in leading perhaps the world, is that at this time um, there's never been a, a period where we've been more dominant. Now there's no doubt that we are, are um, in a sense unfettered in our ability to lead. And at the same time, I would have to say that the disengagement of our country, of our citizens, of the people who need to put the pressure um, on all of the actors who can control some of the outcomes we, we desire, frankly, is, is perhaps at a lower position than it was 50 years ago. We have a country that, um, where people spend something like an average of seven hours a day watching television. Um, I can't think of any uh, thing that is in part of popular television that evokes or helps people to be educated to some of the wrongs that we've addressed this evening. If anything, only um, they strengthen uh, a kind of cynicism and, and arrogance and um, perversion of values uh, that goes against so much of what you said, Billy, and, and in a sense the soul. Uh, we have media moguls uh, that in a sense um, could indeed, I think, perhaps are, are the only handful of people who could um, very quickly um, begin to uh, uh, penetrate uh, the consciousness of the country. And I think as activists, and you are the real activists, um, one of the things we need to think about is how can you be an activist today when in a sense it is much harder to penetrate, in a sense, that public. And without motivating that public, it seems to me that uh, the message, uh, whether or not the things we heard about at dinner this evening uh, or the, the message of the panel becomes much more difficult. And I think perhaps that's the place we should lobby um, in, the, in the offices of the people who determine what uh, our nation is fed on a daily basis. Thank you. For that. That's a wonderful question. Who gets first? By, by way of, of encouragement, I did a talk the other day at Columbia High School in New Jersey, actually two talks, 800 kids in each auditorium. And I speak in high schools a lot, actually more than I do places like this. And <laughs> I'm always amazed, and I have to say continuously encouraged how much when we think about the television, television generation, kids are attentive. 800 kids in the audience, two audiences, silent each time for over 50 minutes and attentive to what I'm saying. And sometimes I wonder, and then I go to a place, to, the, to a high school or junior high or an elementary school, it's 100, 200, 800 kids, and they're all quiet, they're all listening, and they all want to know, and they all want to know what they can do. And they passed around a hat at that school. And at the end of it, they handed me a check, not for me personally, but for a school we're trying to build in Nepal, for $1,000. And that's before they had even heard me speak. So I have to say that in spite of it all, I remain uh, encouraged. And I think it's that that is perhaps the reason why I keep doing what I do, though my mom wonders. <laughs> That's a wonderful response. I'm worried about those kids' parents who <clears throat> I see as being brain dead with absolutely no politics and absolutely not understanding the situation, not even caring. And have you ever seen the results of these polls and what people are thinking about? And you wonder, who do they talk to? Who do they ask? Or is this what most of Americans are thinking? I'm, I'm just amazed, and we can't, we have a hard time, people have very short attention span. I mean, the kids can sit there for an hour, but their parents need those, you know, they like the commercials, the sound bite, the quickness. You know, you gotta have something to snap them up, or you can't hold them together, or you, they won't come back. You know, it's very hard, and uh, <clears throat> I wish for the old days of the 60s, you know, I don't want to go back to those conditions to have them, but at least people engaged you in some real conversation. It's real hard now finding people that you can talk to, so we do have to, uh, we have to start. We have to do it, and maybe this is where we need to shift our energy to the generation 
This might be the generation to do it. They might be the ones who can see it. I was impressed with these kids up here in Boston who were picketing this uh, store, just like, what is it, a guest store or something like that? Yeah, some they were picking, picking in child labor. I was real impressed with that. You know, um, I didn't see too many adults out there. So, you know, that might be one of the strategies is a shift. Yeah, I'd like to see the slogan go from it's the economy stupid to it's justice stupid. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we get there. Oh, want somebody over here. Um, thanks. My name is James, and I, w I was going to invoke, since we seem to be in the business of invoking, uh, people, a uh, couple of people, but the, the last comment, uh, I just wanted to mention that last night uh, there was something on television which I think was a very interesting example of what the person was talking about, about corporate media. ABC, uh, they have a show called 2020. I don't ever watch television, but I decided to watch it because it was something I was interested in. They had a segment about Mumia Abu-Jamal, who's on death row in Pennsylvania. And it was an atrocious hatchet job, just atrocious. And uh, na frankly, National Public Radio hasn't been a lot better. National Public Radio canceled his commentaries at the last minute when there was a lot of right-wing political pressure. And so uh, as long as, I mean, I think it's an, I'm not going to get off on, on the corporate media thing, but um, I, I would hope when we do discuss it, we include uh, institutions like National Public Radio, which I think sometimes have fallen short, although obviously they've been good in, in other areas. Uh, I'd like to invoke uh, the, the memory of uh, Jonathan Mann, who is known better to some people here than to me, but to me he was, he was a fantastic lecturer here at Harvard. Uh, he, uh, from what I understand, did, did fantastic research and incredible practical work in the field uh, and pulling together the fields of health and human rights and, and, and working in the field of, of uh, AIDS uh, uh, prevention and remediation or whatever. And uh, so I just wanted to mention his name, but I would also like to mention the name of somebody who sort of embodies the, the three different categories almost, maybe not the the child labor one, but, uh, uh, and that's Lori Berenson. She's a young American woman. She's in prison in Peru. She's a woman. Her health is suffering because of the, pr the abysmal prison that she's in. She's in fact developing arthritis. She's 29 years old. She was a student here at MIT. She lived right here in Cambridge. She's been in prison now for over three years in Peru without ever having received a trial. There was a secret military proceeding. and. I'm not going to go into any more of it to give other people a chance to, to, to speak, but I brought newsletters about her situation. And perhaps if any of the panelists would like to comment, I mean, this has been brought up before with the International Criminal Court. What is the matter with our government? What is the matter with the Clinton administration uh, that they do not fight, even for a, a, an American citizen who's in prison in another country without a trial? Thank you. Anybody want to uh, address any uh, of those issues, any of those names as symbols? Well, certainly on uh, the, it's uh, something we were discussing uh, at dinner. One can name uh, a significant number of political prisoners and dissidents in China for whom our government uh, has failed to take the kinds of principled <coughs> actions. Uh, that we would uh, expect in fulfillment of its commitments. Uh, with Mr. Fujimura in Peru, uh, uh, it seems to be uh, something that's hardly new. He may be a bastard, but he's our bastard. Uh, and that's what we did uh, with half a dozen other governments uh, that come to mind. Uh, I want to say something about organization that uh, when we were talking about corporate media and the difficulties and all of the rest, uh, part of the two parts of the problem, I think, among many, part of the problem is that the right, which I will define as people who don't care about human rights in any other way you wish to define it, uh, is better organized than we are. And secondly is that unlike us or many of us or many of that vast majority out there, they are not cynical about their, our, their, about their ability to influence the government. And a lot of the people that we need to reach are, because there's a lot of evidence to suggest that without strenuous intervention, indeed, there's nothing you can do, so why bother? We might as well watch television. But it's been tough before, 
and that's not a reason we shouldn't be doing it. Susan, I'd like to, want to address the, the question um, about the Clinton administration having served in that administration for four years. Uh, I had a very interesting experience, I had a lot of interesting experiences. One was uh, Harry Wu was invited to come to Vienna to do a high school graduation, actually, uh, address. And there was much ado back at the State Department about whether or not I, as the American ambassador, would host him. In fact, I got on a plane and flew to Washington to try to pave the way uh, for not only having him in our home, but, but hosting an event which featured him as a speaker. Uh, and in figuring out how to try to pave the way, what I discovered was a split within the State Department. And that split gets played out over and over again. So when you wonder why the American government doesn't take a stand uh, to support a U.S. citizen or some other issue of human rights, very often there's a piece of the American government that is very supportive and another piece of the American government that has a different agenda. Not that they want to be unsupportive of human rights, but they have a different agenda and that issue is gonna get in the way of their agenda. And it becomes a mess, I mean, a, a horrible mess. In this case, we, we got the China desk at the State Department into the room with the human rights people and said, let's come up with a common agreement here. But I knew that if I was meeting with them separately, we would end up with a mess. So it took getting them together. Uh, which is all to say that as much as I respect the whole notion of working inside the political system, it is the NGO or the nonprofit sector that is the most effective on these kinds of issues. And there are those in the US government who in fact on the side beg the nonprofit organizations to sue, to, to demonstrate, to protest, to do letter writing campaigns against the policies of our own government because they know that that, that then gives the US government people an excuse, if you will, to forego another agenda. They say, well, you know, we have this internal constituency, a domestic constituency that we have to respond to also. So we've got to be out there as private citizens and as NGOs and uh, keeping the pressure on. Thank you, Swani. Are we, Samantha, do we have to, how much time, I mean, do we have, we have these people waiting. Okay, we'll do one more question. Which of you were first at your microphone? I, I think you may have been over here. Um, I want to thank you, everyone, um, and the panel uh, for a beautiful presentation on all three panels. And um, there have been so much talk about paradox um, in regard to what takes place here in the United States and even in Massachusetts. And we just spoke about in regard to um, Clinton administration and what takes place in Washington uh, there. But bringing issue here in Massachusetts, um, there were identified those troubled areas which are important um, around the country and in Massachusetts as well. So there is another issue that have not been identified here tonight. And this is issue what takes place in divorce courts of Massachusetts uh, since uh, 94, 92, and even before. It's regard to epidemics of lies that takes place in Massachusetts and how divorce courts destroy people's lives that they cannot actually be citizens in a sense, like be activists, be productive in their workplace, Thank you. study and everything. And this is basically an important issue because- do you, do, you have a, do you have a leaflet which you can give us all uh, to read afterwards? This is actually an article Good. of Massachusetts uh, Lawyers Weekly of do you August have a, 28 of 95 where they address qu uh, quietly in their newspaper that's what, that's epidemic good. of lies, but uh, media like Boston Globe, Boston Herald never emphasize or never uh, spoke about. Thank you. But you. Now you've raised it, so if you put it on the table here, people are going to have a chance to come and read it afterwards, if that's all right for you. Thank you very much. Can I, can I uh, yes, Dasima. There's, um, there's a quotation I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to read here. It's, uh, it's by E.B. White. He, he said, if the world were merely, if it were merely challenging, that would be no problem. But I arise in the morning torn between a desire to improve or save the world, 
and a desire to enjoy or savor the world. <laughs> this makes it hard to plan the day. <laughs> and I think that makes it hard to plan our lives um, as to where we go from here. But I really think some, some basic uh, principles can guide us. The question, I, I, want to, I want to affirm this sister here from India. Um, oh, thank you for the reminder. <coughs> um, on the question of um, cultural rights, I think um, you have made a very important uh, call on us. Our, all our cultural values are threatened in the consumerist society. Um, part of what we can do, and I'm looking for solutions, part of what we can do is, for example, to insist on food self-sufficiency as public policy and choose <coughs> the kinds of cultural experiences we want. I mean, this is ridiculous, but I want you to know that the people in my hometown still make most of my clothing. And when they go to Brooklyn as immigrants, I go after them and they still stitch my clothing. But I think I look better than Gap. <laughs> so there are ways you can live in it. There are ways that you can, you can continue it, uh, this way. I also want to uh, uh, respond to the administrator from Harvard. What can we do? You know, when I went into teaching, I, I, and I still wake up with that question, what do I do? Turn your classroom into a learning environment. Turn your students into intellectual activists. And I think that really is very plausible and possible, and I think we should think about that. I just want to remind the brother who spoke about um, uh, Jamal and uh, um, uh, Laurie and others, you know, Amnesty International has just authored a report on the U.S. I think we could read it, we can act on it. I think there are lots of opportunities here at the Harvard the University in Massachusetts for doing good, one little piece at a time. Pass the bill on, 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 uh, on Burma. You know, do the things that matter to you where you are in your sphere. I, I don't think we can, yes, just do something, you know. Uh, guided by the fact that people, not governments, determine the future. If we don't have a mobilized population, we have a polarized government. Um, thank you very much. I, I think on that note, thank you, Decima. We'll um, thank everybody on the panel. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you.